So hello, everyone, and welcome to OEN Engage. Thank you for being with us um, for today's session, Train the Trainer Introduction to Open Pedagogy Workshop. My name is Tanya Groes, and I'm the Director of Educational Programs for the Educa Open Education Network. Joining me is Jamie Whitman, Open Educational Practices Specialist for the OEN and Mentee Master, as you will see. Uh, I have a few housekeeping items first. Uh, we kicked off the week on Monday uh, with Dave's OEN land acknowledgement and the OEN community norms. If you'd like to review them, you can find them in the links posted in the chat. Thank you, Barb, so much for being our chat monitor today. Um, and feel free, please, to add your own land, land acknowledgement. Um, I am joining you from the unceded Dakota lands of St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, you can also visit the Native Land Digital site to learn about the lands that our community members inhabit and dig deeper into our relationships with their heritage, the resources they have, and how we can actively be a better future moving forward. Uh, this session is being recorded to benefit those in our community who are unable to attend. And yes, the links to all of this, to this presentation and to every slide deck that we've offered will be shared out after the event. Uh, if you have comments or questions during the session, please submit them via the chat, and we will do our very best to address them. Um, and now, please join me in welcoming my fellow presenter, Jamie Whitman. Hey, everyone. If you would please join us in Menti, we're going to be using that to uh, get to know a little bit about each other and ask some questions throughout uh, the presentation today. Uh, so you can go to menti.com and enter the code on the screen, or you can uh, scan the QR code here as well. And there's also a link in the chat if you want to use your browser to, to join us. So I'll leave this up uh, for just a couple more seconds. Um, there's, if you want to give a little thumbs up in Menti so we know that you've gotten in okay, and then we can uh, continue on. All right, I'm seeing those thumbs flying. And if at any point you get kicked out of Menti, if you just want to put it in the chat, Barb can add that Menti link. It's Jamie. Okay, so today we are going to talk about establishing an open foundation. Uh, we are going to actually give you the intro to open pedagogy workshop. We are going to do one and only one small group breakout. We'll have a couple breaks. Uh, Jamie will lead you through facilitating and experiencing an open pedagogy learning circle. Um, and we will give you some examples, the curriculum itself, getting started and lessons learned all from learning circle. And then we will hopefully have time, a decent amount of time for some questions. So first of all though, uh, OEN, who are we? I'd like to give you just a little bit more information about um, us and who's aren't in our network and our goals. We are not a vendor, we are a diverse network of higher ed institutions working together to make higher ed more affordable, equitable and accessible. We represent more than 1800, I like saying that big number, member campuses across the United States, Canada, Australia and the United Kingdom who strive to make higher ed more open. Specifically, next slide, please. Specifically, the OEN is focused on action that advances open ed in ways that are shareable, collaborative, and sustainable. We do this by sharing the experiences and expertise of our community in ways to support our members, you. As a community, we are working together to help everyone in higher ed. The best example of our efforts to support the common good is the Open Textbook Library, the OTL, a comprehensive library of open textbooks reviewed by faculty that make open textbooks freely available to anyone, anywhere, at any time. Yet ultimately, we're thinking of and trying to address something even bigger, and that is the advancement of educational equity through resources and practices, and we're going to talk today about those practices, that are more affordable, more accessible, and more inclusive. And we'd love to know who you are. Um, so if you want to share your name, title, and where you're from, which you probably are already doing, sorry, I haven't had a chance to look at the chat, um, please feel free to do that. Uh, we welcome you and are glad you are here. Next slide, please. 
Um, we want you to go ahead today and make yourself comfortable. Uh, while we um, invite you to have your cameras on, if you feel like you want to, you can feel free to leave them off if you prefer to sip your coffee in uh, virtual silence. Please place questions in the chat. Um, if you need to use the restroom, go refill water, whatever you need to do, please today just take care of yourself because we know that a couple hours is a long time to sit and, and watch a screen. Uh, this workshop uh, actually exists because you all kept telling us you needed more support around open ped. So a couple of years ago, we rolled out a certificate program in open educational practices. We created a faculty workshop encompassed within this workshop. And we also offered open pedagogy learning circles, which we'll share with you today. We welcome any feedback you'd like to share with us. So thank you again for joining us today. I'll turn it over to Jamie. All right. Uh, like Tanya said, we are really excited you all are here to join us for this uh, Train the Trainer and the Intro to Open Pedagogy Workshop, as well as the Learning Circle. And so we just wanted to check in and see how everyone's feeling today. This is Thursday of a long week of different presentations and um, community building. And so just checking in to see how everyone's feeling. And if you need the QR code to join, uh, that is on there as well if you're using a phone or a tablet, um, or you can use the link that is in the chat for mentees. All right, so we've got some energetics, some chill, some sleepy, some curious, and a couple overwhelms. Hopefully this does not add to your overwhelm, but uh, maybe jumps you over to the, the more curious or uh, energetic phase over here. And then uh, again, so we can just get to know, e know each other a little bit. What is your favorite summer activity? Hiking, relaxing. Yes, other, please list in chat. We'd love to know what else you'd like to do. Reading tons of books for fun. Yes, that is always a really exciting time. Mountain biking, that sounds super fun too. I, am, I myself am a big hiker. I haven't quite graduated to the mountain biking stage yet, but uh, hiking is always really fun for me. And I also really enjoy gardening in the summer. Uh, lots of folks just relaxing. Okay, thank you so much for uh, participating and you know getting to know each other and engaging with each other. Uh, today, our focus is going to be on open pedagogy. Uh, however, open pedagogy starts with open educational resources and the practices enabled through the use of OER. Uh, so just to ensure that we're all on the same page uh, foundationally, we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. And so we are defining open as free plus these different permissions. Uh, and these are permissions are to copy, mix, share, keep, edit, or use, or you might be more familiar with the five Rs of retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute as David Wiley calls them. In other words, Creative Commons grants the ability to update content, customize content, and improve content, which leads us into the pedagogy part. And so in terms of pedagogy, scholars Wiley and Hilton sought to further narrow and define the concept, concept of open pedagogy, ultimately settling on the term OER-enabled pedagogy, defined as a set of teaching and learning practices that are only possible or practical in the context of those five R permissions that are characteristic of OER. Furthermore, building exclusively on the five R's that we just talked about, educators can ask the following four questions to better distinguish OER-enabled pedagogy from project-based learning. Are students asked to create new artifacts or revise or remix existing OER? Does that new artifact have value beyond supporting the learner of its author? Are students invited to publicly share their new artifacts or revise and remix OER? And are students invited to openly license their new artifacts or revised remixed OER? And as Tanya mentioned uh, previously, for several years now, uh, we had been hearing from our members that they wanted more resources around open pedagogy. Um, and I can speak from my own experience as a librarian in previous roles that I could echo that same sentiment. There hasn't been a lot of support around open pedagogy previously, and I wanted some support and resources that I could then turn around and provide that same support to my own classroom faculty colleagues. 
Um, we know that open pedagogy can be kind of a nebulous space to, space to enter. There's a lot of different definitions and ways to conceptualize open pedagogy. And so what we're going to do is both define it as we walk through the intro to open pedagogy workshop. And we'll also look at a, a few really cool things that open pedagogy does. Uh, but we realize it's not enough to just know open pedagogy can be transformative. We want to acknowledge that there are going to be challenges when you're talking to or helping faculty with open pedagogy. And we're hoping that this workshop that we're about to model for you, the introduction to open pedagogy workshop, will, be, will give you a big assist. Thanks, Jamie. Okay, so gonna walk through the introduction to open pedagogy workshop today, but um, some slides will be skipped because we've already addressed them. Um, but when you get the slide deck, they will all be there. Um, so you can unhide them, change them, uh, however you need to for your context. Okay, so today um, we will walk through the problem one solution to the problem or problems we're facing in higher ed, some definitions of open ped, um, examples and benefits, and we will also give you some practical ways to engage with open pedagogy uh, after the workshop is concluded. Uh, now we're gonna skip some of the introductory stuff and go to the problems, some of the problems. I know that you know these problems, but it helps to establish kind of a context for why we're entering into this space, in addition to the fact that the community has asked us to. Uh, so let's talk about a few of the problems. <clears throat> and of course, cost is always going to be um, one of the problems. Um, and, and student debt is a, a big deal still and will probably remain a big deal. We know that students are shouldering the costs uh, in a bigger way than they have um, in previous decades. That average federal student loan debt is over 37,000. That private student loan debt averages 54, almost 55,000 per borrower. That the average student borrows over 30,000 to pursue a bachelor's degree. That 45.3 million borrowers have student loan debt and 92% of them have federal loan debt that 20 years after entering school, half of student borrowers still owe 20,000 each on outstanding loan balances. With houses as expensive as they are, you can see how this monthly repayment of loans would be a huge burden on students. Next slide, please. But it's not just the cost of a degree, it's the cost of the materials, or as a, a student aptly named it in a video that we used to show regularly, the second tuition. Uh, I know that, that textbooks are, have been going down recently, but overall, the price of textbooks increases by an average of 12% with each new edition. Between 77 and 2015, the cost of textbooks increased over 1,000%. From 2000 to 2012, and textbook inflation outpaced consum consumer price growth by 192.9%. And so while it's great that we all seem to be more aware of the cost of course materials, and we are all trying desperately to implement affordability initiatives, I think most of us have experienced or know someone who has experienced the pain of a $200 textbook. Or as my daughter had to deal with last spring, a $75 access code that expires right before the final, which was a mistake, but it happened, um, or have been opted into an inclusive or equitable access program without fully understanding the implications of it. Um, and these cost problems impact some students more than others. This is from the Balancing Act, the trade-offs and challenges facing Black students in higher education. And in this 2023 report from the Lumina Foundation, um, the report suggests that six-year completion rates for any type of degree are lower for Black students than for those in other racial or ethnic groups. 21% of currently enrolled Black students say that they feel discriminated against frequently or occasionally at their institution. In addition, um, while we've talked about a little bit about students having to shoulder the burden of tuition costs and textbook costs, as well as the disproportionate effect those barriers might have on some students of color, 
I want us also to stop and take a beat and consider the psychological messages we send to students in terms of who belongs and who doesn't belong based on the need to pay expensive tuition, buy a $100 textbook, and that textbook that likely does not reflect any faces or culture that looks like theirs. These financial barriers and inability to see themselves in the curriculum can have a direct impact on students' sense of belonging, particularly those who come from historically marginalized backgrounds. These students may feel like they just aren't being seen in the classroom. So that's just a brief overview of the problems, and I'm totally aware that I'm just skimming the surface. Um, but let's turn to one possible solution to making education more inclusive, more affordable, more equitable. And, and I'm aware it's a solution, not these, the solution. And it's open pedagogy. So let's get into that a little bit. Um, first, it's let's define its parts, open first, and then pedagogy. I'm not going to go through this next slide because Jamie has already taken us through it. Um, but if you all had not heard that, I would want to make sure foundationally that you understood it's the perm permissions associated with Creative Commons licensing and open that provides the foundation for all these wonderful pedagogical practices that we're going to get into. Next slide, please. Um, and, and I'm sure if you've delved into open ped at all, you're aware that there are myriad definitions. Um, and so if you find this overwhelming, we'd like to hear that feedback. I think we wanted to do a good job of kind of canvassing the, the definitions and highlighting what we think is kind of the heart of open ped. So let's go through that. And then you can give us feedback later about, oh, too many, Tanya, you know, cut it down to just one or two. Or yeah, that was good. Because really, um, it, it open pedagogy encompasses multiple things, right? So for a, compre a more comprehensive definition, I like this one from BC Campus, which centers students co-creating. Open PED, also known as Open Educational Practices, is the use of open educational resources to support learning. When you use Open PED in your classroom, you are inviting your students to be a part of the teaching process, participating in the co-creation of knowledge. As a teacher of 25 plus years in classroom and online, that feels good to me. I don't want to be a sage on a stage. I want my students to be part of it. I want them to enter into the conversation with me. I like how Rajiv Jangiani says that open ped is an access oriented commitment to learner driven education, an access oriented commitment to learner driven education. So that one way of thinking about what open ped does is that it invites students to be part of the process participating. I really like how that feels as a teacher. Um, another definition suggests that open pedagogy is the practice of engaging with students as creators of information rather than simply consumers of it. Furthermore, it's a form of experiential learning in which students demonstrate understanding through the act of creation. And that means that anyone can create educational resources. It's engaging students to do all of those things, to copy, share, edit, mix, keep, and use. It's inviting them into the space to be co-creators. So why, why do open pedagogy? Maybe it's obvious from the definition, but just in case it's not, let's hit you with one final definition from the University of Texas Arlington that always does such a good job with these things. They say that open pedagogy is the practice of engaging with students as creators of information rather than simply consumers. It's a form of experiential learning in which students demonstrate understanding through the act of creation. The products of open pedagogy are student created and openly licensed so that they may live outside of the classroom in a way that has an impact on the greater community. I have been accused of highlighting too many words in a slide, and I 100% know I'm guilty on this slide, but I just, there's so much goodness. Um, and I love how it talks about the products that live outside of the classroom in a way that has an impact on future classes and the community, as opposed to something that's used once and thrown in the trash. Um, and also, 
how might open pedagogy help with that problem of belonging that we talked about earlier? Well, according to a large study of more than 26,000 students across 22 four-year universities, students who are encouraged to feel that they belong, like by inviting them into the learning process to co-create with you, those people are more likely to complete their first year. And I think that the intentionality and student-centeredness of open pedagogy can really help with that. And now I'm going to pass it to Jamie to talk a little bit more about what the products of open pedagogy can look like. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, so how does open pedagogy address all of these problems that we've covered? Uh, we're gonna look at a couple of examples so we can see open pedagogy in practice to answer that question. This first example is a Wikipedia assignment uh, for a gender and technology course at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, for some context in the background of this assignment, women, and especially women who have made notable achievements in the STEM fields, are underrepresented on Wikipedia. So this assignment was a perfect opportunity to not only provide students with experience in public writing, extending beyond the classroom, but also to tackle hands-on the questions of gender inequality that the course addressed. So this assignment addresses the problem of students not seeing themselves in the curriculum with open pedagogy providing a solution by addressing that gender inequality and treating students as co-creators in knowledge. This next example is called a celebration of what you know. This is from Maricopa Community College. It's a final assignment that gives students the choice of how to complete their final project for the course. So students can choose the format option that most aligns with their own skill set which gives them the opportunity to think critically about how they will present their mastery of key aspects of the course in a meaningful way. Uh, students also participate in a peer review process, which allows them to explore other topics from the course. This assignment design centers student agency and choice, while also creating active participants and knowledge creation. Uh, assignments like this get at that sense of belonging, and they say to students that the instructor cares about their opinions and values their voice and culture. In this course on contemporary Russia, the professor invited her students to co-design a syllabus, so really bringing students in right at the beginning of the class. The class collaboratively generated student learning outcomes and expectations for themselves and the instructor, and this process invites students to be more involved with what they are interested in, what they think is important, and how limited their sense of the topic in the course is. Um, of course, with something like this, the instructor would still maintain their overall course priorities and overall learning objectives, but students now have a say in determining how they achieve those goals. And again, this instructor is intentionally centering the student experience and highlighting their agency. Um, she's demonstrating that she values their contribution contributions and she's creating that more engaged community of learners. These two assignments address the problem of students lacking a sense of belonging and a sense of agency. And it also addresses how students don't always see, see themselves in the curriculum. With open pedagogy, we can solve these problems by giving, giving students a voice in their learning and how they complete their work and give them opportunities to be co-creators and knowledge. We have a couple more examples. Here. This one is an open textbook, which is the work of Clemson University's public health science program. The goals of this project were to meet the course learning objective of understanding weight issues and to develop a product for the general public to use as a resource for these health conditions. So students divided the chapters up amongst themselves and they wrote their own individual chapters while also peer reviewing all of the chapters and providing feedback to their peers. This allowed for deeper understanding of the course content and it helps to elevate, this assignment helps to elevate and center the student voice and experience. In this social psychology course, 35 students ended up writing over 1,000 multiple choice questions to create a test bank that would accompany the OER textbook they used in class. Not only does this type of assignment encourage the kind of deep learning that comes as a result of students synthesizing subject matter, but it contributed to the public knowledge commons because this OER did not have a test bank previously. Assignments like this one create, create higher levels of intrinsic motivation in students, which often leads to higher levels of success. 
And they also help to deconstruct those traditional power structures, telling students that they are smart enough to write these test questions and centering their sense of agency and belonging. And lastly, this open pedagogy project will be implemented into a secondary reading methods course uh, that is taught in collaboration between Minnesota State University at Mankato and a school in Sierra Leone. Students in each location will design vocabulary development lessons for each other. They'll share their lesson plans and get feedback from each other before delivering their final lessons and video clips. Students will be invited to share these lesson plans and videos via an OER Google site developed for the course. This open pedagogy project really encourages students to get involved with the work they are doing and fosters that sense of agency. It also teaches students how their work can be used on a global scale and creates a sense of community between students. These three examples address the problems of students lacking a sense of agency and community, as well as the cost of course materials. Open pedagogy can help to solve these problems by treating students as co-creators of knowledge, allowing students to contribute to a discipline and share their work with others, lowering the cost burden for the next set of students and creating community amongst themselves. Pass so, it back to Tanya. So sorry, I was slow on the uptake, Jamie. Uh, so as a big picture overview, open pedagogy shifts learning from content centric to process centric, from teacher centric to learner centric. In addition, open ped uh, students go from consumers to creators. Assignments go from things that are created to be graded to objects that have relevance in the real world. <clears throat> so as you've seen from these cool examples, the last one being from just our last round of the certificate in open educational practices. And I was like, that's so cool that they're communicating from Minnesota State Mankato to um, Sierra Leone and like going back and forth with vocabulary lessons. That's like so cool. And open pedagogy and the open licensing behind it is what fueled that innovation and that ability um, to, to work in these ways, which is so exciting. Um, so as you've seen from these examples, open ped really has many benefits. It centers student agency. It gives students the opportunity to shape their own learning, to participate in the learning process, on a more equal, but also individualized basis, taking some of their context, some of their culture and their story and infusing it into what they're creating. In these examples, students are editing Wikipedia to make it more inclusive and truthful. They're determining what a syllabus in a class might look like, writing questions for their exams, and actually even writing a textbook that will help future students and the public. Like that's pretty cool. Um, also, open pedagogy can deconstruct traditional power structures. Instead of the sage on the stage, which I never want to be when I'm when I'm um, acting as professor, the professor is facilitating a learning experience and an ongoing dialogue with students' interest and choice and background in mind. Student pedagogy also, or open pedagogy, sorry, um, also allows for deeper learning. Um, certainly, in order to write quiz questions, students would have to synthesize the information. They would have to understand it well enough to actually write the questions. And the students who co-wrote the textbook on obesity and eating disorders had to understand that information well enough to write coherently about it. Talk about really deep and active learning. Also, it invites students in to be co-creators in knowledge. They actually got the experience of the form and structure and process of writing a textbook. And then they can put that experience on a CV or a resume, resume and carry it for, forward. OpenPed also contributes to knowledge beyond a simple assignment or just a simple classroom. It's renewable versus disposable. So instead of that assignment that's completed, graded, thrown away, never thought of again, which, and, the, and that kind of assignment has its place. I'm not saying it doesn't. But in this setting, the examples we've shared are all contributing to that larger body of knowledge that will be used long after the particular class is over. Um, also, I think we saw how open pedagogy creates a more inclusive learning environment because students are invited to use their background and cultural context as they participate in creating a textbook or updating Wikipedia or constructing a syllabus. 
And finally, I think OpenPED demonstrates transparency on the part of the instructor. It encourages us as faculty to rethink what learning should look like. It can open up new doors of collaborating with our students, inviting them into the learning experience, and it can be transformative. But what do students think of OpenPED? Well, OpenPED is still new enough that there's lots of research to be done, lots of opportunity to research greater. But according to several studies, students do find that open pedagogy is a positive learning experience. Across these studies, students generally perceived OpenPED as a positive and meaningful learning experience. They appreciated developing artifacts that could be used by others. They express, expressed a, a, appreciation um, because it a, a appeared to foster pride in their work, likely because they would knew they knew that it would be seen and used by others. It's not just something to be thrown away. Um, in addition, students reported feeling um, that sense of agency as scholars, that they were contributing to a body of knowledge rather than simply consuming what's already known. Um, I love this as a longtime teacher. They developed better cri critical thinking skills. I always want that out of whatever we are doing in the classroom. They reported better critical thinking skills um, because than traditional pedagogy, probably because they had to evaluate sources. They had to synthesize ideas um, and in addition to giving and receiving feedback to improve their work. Um, and, you know, I think in open ped, we get them operating on those higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy, right? And another side benefit is that they reported better perceptions of OER. Um, because then, then the students did in the open ped sections using the same, um, you know, a traditional textbook. So students in the open ped section may have been more skeptical of the existing textbook. I'm not sure. Rather than accepting the textbook as being authoritative and complete, students who are tasked with improving the textbook realized that, like all textbooks, it was imperfect and they could have a role in making that better, which I think is pretty exciting. So. Is there anything in these foundational definitions or what open pedagogy does that resonates with you as an educator? Whatever you do in your role, I think we all educate in different ways. Is there anything that resonates with you? Please feel free to share in the, in the chat. Or if you'd like to unmute, feel free to unmute. <clears throat> All right, we have some responses coming in through Menti. Uh, so agency for students and genders engagement with the material, improving critical thinking, students as creator, uh, another vote for critical thinking skills. Um, let's see, this one says, I like the earlier slide with four questions on it. I think that very clearly conveys the scope of what's possible, definitely. Uh, giving students agency, providing deeper learning experiences and boosting critical thinking skills, meaningful learning experiences, deeper engagement with the material, students in control of their own learning objectives, student involvement with their assignments, students as creators, and Bloom's taxonomy definitely was a high school teacher before I pivoted to the library. And I see now that some faculty are potentially implementing open pred practices without knowing it. They just aren't using OER in conjunct conjunction. Yeah, there are probably hundreds of thousands of educators that are already doing some of these types of practices and implementing open pedagogy. And when we get to work with them and we get to talk about it a little bit more, they even recognize that they're doing some of this stuff themselves. And when we talk a little bit more about traditional and renewable assignments later on, uh, we'll see how some of these really exist on a spectrum. So there's lots of levels within open pedagogy that uh, folks might already be doing. Uh, norming the concept that learning occurs beyond a classroom and is the responsibility right of every person uh, definitely contributing to that public knowledge commons, having work out in the open where everybody can benefit from the hard work that goes into these different resources, deconstructing traditional knowledge structures, uh, the idea that students have things they can contribute, give ownership and agency. Oh, and one more. Graduate students getting writing experience and digging into topics that are interesting. Yes, definitely allowing folks to um, have time to really think about it. And that's where the, you know, the increase in engagement and critical thinking skills comes into play where students can actually put their own sense of what's interesting to them and what uh, they want to get out of their own learning experience. 
And I think I got them all. Jamie, if I forget, um, if we have time, let's talk about how Menti is different um, or similar sure. to Pulls Anywhere or Jamboard or anything like that and why you like it. Um, Jamie has convinced me that Menti is is good. And part of I like the, and I'm going to say it wrong because I'm old, GIFs, 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 whatever. Uh, the, the cool moving videos, whatever those are called. <laughs> I really like Menti for that. But Okay, so anyway, sorry that I forgot about Menti for a second. Um, so the question is, how can you get started with open pedagogy? Well, we have a few suggestions for you. Or if you are a librarian um, or uh, in another role and you wanna help faculty get started with um, open pedagogy, here are a few suggestions that we, that we have. Um, so it was important to me to get my uh, wonderful colleagues and friends, Will Cross, copyright right expert and librarian, uh, Lindsay Gavush, a librarian, open educational resources specialist extraordinaire, and Heather Maselli, um, open ped uh, expert, and, as well as ungrading and all sorts of uh, things. She's now at AACNU, but at that point, she was a faculty member and she still teaches. Um, you could watch this video just to get all those different perspectives, I think is super helpful. Like how can I as a librarian support people? How can I as a copyright expert get behind this? How can I as a faculty use this in my class? So if you wanna see all of those um, different perspectives from um, vetted open um, ped practitioners, you might wanna watch that. Um, you also could sign up for an open pedagogy learning circle interest list. Um, you are going to see open pedagogy learning circles in action in a little bit. Um, but uh, once a semester, we facilitate a learning circle on open pedagogy um, where people create a renewable assignment or um, a, a digital learning object around open pedagogy. Um, and we give you tips on how to use your curriculum and everything. So if you'd like to sign up, feel free. Um, we offer it once in the fall and once in the spring. And if there was demand, we'd probably offer it once in the summer. Um, for the last couple of years, we have run the Certificate in Open Educational Practices uh, funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Thank you, IMLS. Uh, the next session will hopefully run in the spring of 2025. This program takes faculty and librarian pairs. It provides a facilitated online course about open educational practices, and then it has the librarian faculty team implement an open pedagogy project on their own campus. So they take either, it could be a lesson, usually it's a unit or a whole class, and they transform it and make it better through open pedagogy. Uh, the pilot offering, which was run twice, really, uh, we saw some truly wonderfully transformed curriculum through the power of open pedagogy. Um, and that Sierra Leone, Mankato State thing, our University of Minnesota at Mankato State, that was something from the last round of our certificate program. So if you're interested, sign up on the interest list and we will send you information. Uh, the Open Pedagogy Portal uh, is both a repository and a referatory for real life examples of renewable assignments, student work products, and teaching and learning resources about open pedagogy. Uh, the portal can be browsed by discipline, which was really important to me. It can be searched using keywords. And if you or anyone you know has a renewable assignment, student work product, or teaching and learning resources that qualify as open pedagogy, there's a submission form to have it added to the portal. Um, starting out small with some work featured from both the CERT and OEP and the Learning Circle final projects, but it's growing. And we hope that in time, it will become a really robust directory of open pedagogy work and a place to learn, adapt, remix, and share that work. So please feel free to check that out and please feel free to submit. And there, there's one more uh, resource on here that I don't actually have a slide for on Menti, but it is the student, um, the Open Pedagogy Student Toolkit, uh, which is a toolkit that's intended to um, help students kind of get a grasp on open pedagogy. Um, it is a really great way to scaffold conversations about open pedagogy with your students and to prepare them for working in the open. 
Um, and thanks, Barb, for putting that all of all of these links in the chat. And all of these different resources can be found on the Open Pedagogy webpage on the OEN website. Yes, thank you, Amy, for suggesting that and for also being one of our reviewers for it. Uh, so now that you've seen the Intro to Open Pedagogy workshop for faculty, uh, how do you feel about your ability to offer it for All right, some enthusiastics ready to go. A little nervous, a little, little curious still. If anybody would like to share uh, more about their thoughts, please feel free to unmute or use the chat. Um, And as we mentioned, uh, we know that there are going to be uh, some challenges that you might face when you're trying to engage with faculty around open pedagogy. Um, so if you would like to maybe brainstorm a little bit of a challenge that you think you might face, um, we'll be able to share that with everyone. Finding time. Time to develop their courses. Yeah, I think time is probably the the biggest challenge with this. Uh, it's a lot of thinking that has to go into it um, and support, you know, not only for the faculty member to think about the time to develop their courses, but also your own support um, so that you don't burn yourself out trying to do as much as you can for your faculty members. Uh, convincing faculty to invest the time in reworking their courses. Uh, currently prioritizing high impact practices from AACU. I do not want them to think I'm trying to get them to believe that open pedagogy is the only good pedagogy. Yes, definitely. That's a, a big piece, I think, especially with the uh, this term disposable assignments versus renewable assignments. Uh, we typically like to talk about it more in traditional assignments versus renewable assignments. It, it starts the conversation out, I think, on a better foot than, uh, you know, maybe being a little bit more combative or aggressive by calling their current assignments disposable. Uh, faculty resistance, complacency, faculty have no spare time, uh, author of their own textbook, admin wants to see change happen immediately after investing in something, faculty are understaffed and don't have time to work on anything new. Yes, this is, a, as we talked about, these, this type of work exists on a spectrum, so it's really difficult to expect somebody to immediately make a shift and turn over brand new results without being able to invest the time and have the support. Balancing with other responsibilities as we take on multiple open pedagogy collaborations. Limit, I have limited instructional design experience and don't have much resources to help engage faculty with this. Yes, definitely, like I said, not only supporting your faculty, but also supporting yourself and having those that support available to you. Uh, supporting their publication of student work. And I do not want to unconsciously lean into the idea that fair use with traditionally published materials is simply too hard and they should not bother. Faculty are interested, but don't understand how to do this appropriately. Uh, thinking about FERPA, and we don't necessarily have bandwidth to help them. And similar barriers, barriers that other pedagogies face, are like service learning or project-based learning. Thank you all for sharing. Uh, so we are going to do our, our one and only breakout room that we have scheduled. And of course, you do not have to uh, accept the invite to your room uh, when you get it. Um, but what we'd like you to do, if you'd be willing to participate in the breakout room, is to think of some of these barriers and try and brainstorm some solutions for these with your, uh, with your group mates. Um, and then, um, you know, if you would, be, would like to share them afterwards, that would be uh, fantastic. Yes, you're uh, like Tanya said, you're welcome to just hang out. And if you're just hanging out in the main room, if you maybe want to um, um, brainstorm on your own some solutions that you might have to some of these problems and then potentially share that. Uh, so I do have the slide up in Menti with all of those different barriers. Um, but if you want to you know, think of new barriers in your group, uh, feel free to come up with a couple and then some solutions, some potential solutions for those.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the time to uh, meet with uh, our other folks and participants in the session to think about some solutions to all of those different barriers. Uh, is there anyone who would like to uh, share what your group might have come up with? Um, or if you were solo brainstorming what you came up with, uh, you can feel free to use the uh, to unmute or share in the chat uh, some of your solutions. All right, let's see. Uh, so Emery said that her group talked about lack of faculty and librarian time with a potential solution of learning circles, learning communities, uh, still take time, still takes time, but it's a dedicated option um, and potentially stipended. And it can feel less of a burden when you're sort of in community uh, with folks. Anita mentioned starting small. Uh, definitely, yeah, this doesn't have to be a, a whole course overhaul. Um, it can be really small intentional steps. Uh, Cheryl shared that uh, they found that instructors need a lot of support practicing OpenPed, uh, including student training on copyright, Creative Commons licenses, and that they um, adapted Pub 101 student agreement, which was helpful. Melissa talked about the lack of pedagogical support with solutions of pulling examples and copy the patterns as initial quick way to ensure well-structured assignment design. Um, and Melissa shared very helpful info about the tilt model, the transparency in uh, learning and teaching. Melissa, you can correct me if I'm wrong with that. No, that's correct. Okay. Uh, and Kathy said they chatted about partnerships with teaching and learning centers. Also, to what extent librarians are seen as educators. Yeah, so definitely trying to sort of sort of spread the support structures that are available to and partnering with these different places on campus instead of working in our individualized silos. Uh, feel free to continue sharing if you'd like. Um, thank you for those solutions. They're really thoughtful and insightful. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to take some of this back with you um, as you're thinking about um, open, open pedagogy and how you can really start talking with your faculty about it and maybe um, putting on the Intro to Open Pedagogy workshop yourself. Uh, we are uh, going to take a five minute break uh, so we can come down from our, our sharing of ideas with each other, uh, maybe stretch our legs a little bit. And when we come back, we'll talk about facilitating an open pedagogy learning circle. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, before we get started with the next um, part of our Train the Trainer today, I was just going to invite Melissa to share a little bit more about uh, her solution. Um, in terms of um, pulling pulling and copying patterns, if you'd like to, Melissa. Absolutely, sorry, I, I was, um, and uh, forgive me, I can't, um, the, the settings won't let me show my face, but I'm here, I swear. Um, what I, we were talking, so I was in a group with librarians, right? Which of, of course, I love that. Uh, but we were talking about the fact that a lot of times the librarians, they understand the concept, they wanna encourage it, they know it's out there, but if faculty ask for advice for how exactly do you design or structure an open pedagogy project, they don't always feel equipped and they don't always have access to an instructional designer or somebody to help with that. So one of the, the solutions we talked about was, um, if I mean, good design is all about patterns and structures. And so when you see an effective assignment, um, out there examples of open pedagogy like what you see on the the portal um it's um it, the quick and dirty way to address that is copy the way it's structured and um that kind of would give people a jump start but i mentioned specifically tilt or transparency in learning and teaching because we're working on developing open pedagogy projects that follow that structure the very short of it is they um uh, this very long-term, wide-ranging research project showed that bringing in these really simple elements to assignment structure make a huge difference in things like retention, sense of belonging, metacognition, and so on, and even more so for a lot of the populations that we're looking to support when we want to um, reduce equity disparities in, in student outcomes. So um, <clears throat> it's just a, a simply being really clear about what the purpose of the assignment is, what value or benefit it brings, being very clear about the task, not just do this thing, but here's where you get the resources and support, and this is um, this is the tool we'd like you to use. But then also the criteria, which I think is crucial, um, where you're very transparent about this is how this will be evaluated. 
Um, and also, this is an example of what an effective version of this in product looks like. Let's evaluate that together. Let's walk through why that works. And so um, we use the, the tilt structure on, on our assignments and it tends to be really, really effective. So I was just advocating for, that's a nice, simple thing to do. Can you do purpose task criteria? Um, if you're not an ID, that's a great place to start. Thanks so much, Melissa, for sharing that um, and, the, and the links to uh, more information about Tilt as well. All right, so we are going to jump into facilitating an open pedagogy learning circle, uh, which, as uh, some of you mentioned, was one of the solutions that you came up to some of, this, some of these barriers that you might face uh, when talking with faculty about open pedagogy. Uh, before we get into um, facilitating this, uh, we do need you to join us in Menti again. This is a different Menti, uh, so you'll need to use the, the code on the screen or the QR code, um, or uh, there will be a link in the chat in just a moment. And I'll just stay on this page for just another second, a couple seconds uh, while folks get back into uh, Menti. And if you need me to pull up the uh, QR code at any point during the slides, please let me know. There should also be a join mentee uh, at mentee.com with a code up on the top of the All uh, So we know that we need different options for professional development around open pedagogy um, and ways to engage faculty around open pedagogy. And some might want a short-term community like the one offered in a learning service. Um, our three cohorts for this have been really successful, and we're eager to pass along what we have created and learned to you. So there are many reasons we chose to have our OEN fellow for 2023, Amanda Larson from the Ohio State Univers University, to devote her time to designing this learning circle and creating the curriculum for us. Um, and I believe she might be here, so um, Amanda, please chime in with anything that you'd like to share. Uh, but we know that a facilitated learning circle experience can help to form community. And we've loved how our participants in the different cohorts have really stepped in to answer each other's questions and the different experiences and roles have really complemented each other. Um, because we have someone facilitating, um, Amanda uh, facilitated our pilot program of the learning circle and I have facilitated the other two cohorts that we've had so far. Um, it's a pretty low stakes environment. We use slide decks and Menti, uh, to um, engage folks, and we uh, don't force anybody to talk or share, but um, we really hoped participants would want to engage, um, and they have, and it's been a really great conversations in all of the cohorts on the different topics with open pedagogy. Uh, the nature of open pedagogy itself is collaborative. It's an intentional centering of student agency and experience, so taking time to talk about the key issues surrounding um, and involved in open pedagogy uh, make participants feel more confident about trying it out in their classrooms, or talking to their colleagues about it. Uh, and the OEN always wants to equip others to do what we do. So all of our curriculum is openly licensed. We know you have your own institutional setting and context that you might be bringing this to. So you can use all of our curriculum, you can use some of our curriculum, you can adapt it and decide not to use any of it or certain parts of it. And that's why we openly license it and give it to you uh, with some tips and tricks so you can learn from us and then uh, go make your own learning circle the way that you Our overall goals for the Learning Circle experience uh, is to maintain and iterate on the curriculum for the Learning Circle featuring open pedagogy topics, create a scaffolded assignment that allows folks to do open pedagogy, build a community that's learning about open pedagogy compri comprised of both instructors and instructor support roles, and then create training that will help others facilitate the Learning Circle at their own institution, uh, like what we are doing right now. And so we do have some considerations that you might want to take into account if you decide to run your own learning circle. Uh, best practices and research shows that keeping um, the numbers between 10 to 12 people. Um, however, we decided to allow a little bit higher with a, a max of about 15, because uh, we thought there would be attrition and we were right. Uh, during all, In all three cohorts during most synchronous sessions, about eight or nine people attended and participated. We had a really simple application process that we will share with you, uh, but we wanted to make it clear that attendance and a final product were expected in order to receive a certificate. We intentionally wanted faculty and faculty support folks to participate, 
Um, and we've been really happy with this because of the crosstalk and the rich sharing of ideas that happen when you have faculty and faculty support folks together. Uh, this is a lot of information to go through in seven hours and seven weeks. And so we were, uh, we used Menti and we were really thankful for Menti, which helped to engage um, our folks and create community. Um, and at times, um, because it's so much information, uh, it would be nice to have a little bit more open mic time um, for participants to speak, but we still got a lot of rich and really robust discussion out of each session. We modeled and utilized some really carefully chosen tools, um, which we'll share all, with all of you, um, And but you may very well want to implement different tools um, to support the practice of open pedagogy on your own campus. Uh, and we took the time to research about 12 different resources on learning circles, uh, which really provided some of these foundational thoughts on best practices. Uh, so our learning circle is built on um, a best practice foundation with a few recommended practices, which are to consider consistent opening and closing activity activities, uh, which we used Menti for, and you'll get to experience in just a moment. We emailed participants with pre-work that usually consisted of a reading and a video. So we had sort of a flipped model with discussions. We consciously used tools that might be used when engaging in open pedagogy. We offered some time to reflect upon learning in each session. And we used Menti again to um, help share that reflections with each other, those reflections with each other. And we wanted to create, um, we wanted our folks to create something practical for future use, uh, which you'll get to see uh, as we look at some examples later on. Um, and of course, we had consultations uh, for folks who wanted to talk through their final projects um, or questions that they had on any of the topics with me. Okay, so we're going to stop and uh, pretend that you are in the Open Pedagogy Learning Circle, just like we did with the Intro to Open Pedagogy Workshop. Um, we really want you to get a feel for what the learning circle was like for participants, so you can see for yourself whether this type of activity fits your institution and your own goals centered around open pedagogy. Uh, each learning circle session follows the same structure. Uh, the first session for the learning circle is what is open pedagogy, and we go through some definition building and community norm setting. Uh, we've already basically covered that with the Intro to Open Pedagogy workshop. Uh, so we're actually going to do this demonstration with session two, which is traditional versus renewable assignments. All right, so we are going to be in the Open Pedagogy Learning Circle. So welcome back to session two of uh, our Learning Circle. Today we're going to be discussing traditional versus renewable assignments. Here's a look at our agenda for today's session. We'll start with our opening activities, then move on to talking about traditional assignments, renewable assignments, our tool of the week, and then end with our closing activity and a look at what's next. All right, so let's get started with our opening activity. How is everyone feeling today? Feel free to add the same response that you had in our earlier, how are you feeling, or a different one. Yeah, so some happy, some chill, some sleepy, some more curious. Always exciting to see the curious ones in the learning circle sessions uh, when folks are really interested in the materials that we're gonna, going to be going over and the discuss, discussion we're going to have. Uh, and we also always do a fun question too, so we can build community and get to know each other uh, within the learning circle because we have um, only up to 15 people, but likely only around eight, nine, or 10 in each session. It's really nice to get to um, get to know each other and build that community. All right, so what's your favorite ice cream flavor? All right, we've got chocolate and mint chocolate chip tied. Some others, yes, please. We've got we've had some really interesting flavors shared uh, through when using this question in Menti. So please uh, feel free to share uh, your favorite ice cream. Pistachio, salted caramel. Yes, I am a fan of salted caramel myself. Caramel from Kelly. Mm -hmm. Melissa, all of them. Yeah, for me, you really can't go wrong with ice cream. Um, and I, fortunately, I don't see any I don't like ice creams on there. Uh, most recent blueberry lime cheesecake. That sounds excellent. Bride's cake. Fish food. Yeah, Ben and Jerry's. Can't go wrong with Ben and Jerry's either. All 
All right, thanks so much for sharing, everyone. Uh, so we're going to start talking about uh, our main topic for today, which is traditional versus renewable assignments. Oh, and one more, Marion Berry oatmeal cookie. Oh, that sounds really interesting, too. OK, so to get started, uh, let's think about how you might define a traditional assignment. Five hundred word essay, uh, and I will say a part of the pre work is um, going over some of these definitions of traditional and renewable assignments. Um, so while you're kind of being thrown right into answering this question uh, during this experience here, um, in the actual learning circle, you'll have had the pre work to sort of build up to this. Discussion boards, uh, audience of one, just the instructor. Student provides an artifact that helps to show learning competencies. Students turn an essay to professor via Blackboard, uh, basic recall skills, something that is graded and then is finished in its value. A demonstration of knowledge or understanding in a one and done format. Reflections, students submit something which demonstrates their learning and they receive a grade and maybe feedback, a research paper, quizzes, papers, questions after readings, discussion boards, presentations building skills toward learning objectives while in, while providing instructor assessment opportunity, space to experiment fail, one and done, something your parents probably did in school. I like that one. All right, thanks for sharing. Uh, so you might have heard this definition before, using the term disposable to talk about traditional assignments. And says that student assignments are often very transactional in nature, seen only by the instructor for the purpose of demonstrating content mastery and achievement of learning objectives. This closed feedback loop between the student and instructor has been coined disposable by scholars Wiley and Hilton. And I think what this definition really captures, um, and that uh, your example showed too, is that these types of assignments have no further meaning beyond that single classroom and that single grade. They don't contribute to the larger community. Um, but I do want to be really clear that there is definitely value in these more transactional and traditional types of assignments. They help students practice skills, problem solve, and show content mastery, which is still uh, super important in a course. Uh, what open pedagogy is really working towards, though, is to add that further value into these assignments so that they can tr contribute to their communities, either locally or globally, and give students agency over their educational exper experience. Uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, the OEN, we like to use the term traditional instead of disposable. Again, starts off on, I think, a better footing when talking to faculty about this type of work. Um, and so for um, and in all of these discussions around open pedagogy, we will use traditional assignments. Uh, why might students be resistant to traditional assignments? So now that we have that definition, um, you know, why, why do you think students might be resistant to this type of, these more traditional transactional assignments? Feels like busy work. Don't see relevance. Busy work. Feels pointless. They might not know the purpose for them. There's a lot of them, and it feels like every single one is an extraction out of them. They don't see it help, how it helps them in the future. Some students see assignments as busy work. They're not valuable to their learning. No personal investment. Boring. They see no connection to the real world. They recognize that generative AI can often produce them. Yeah, so that's sort of adding a, another piece into the open pedagogy conversation. I see, um, see a pattern developing with these responses. Banking education, yes, going back to you know Paul Freire and uh, his philosophy on pedagogy. Why spend time on something that will never be seen again? Old school feels like a vacuum of work. Seems like high school. Treat it like a game to get a grade. Uh, unclear usefulness, lack of transparency for why they matter. Yeah, these are all uh, really great reasons for why students might feel this way. Often feels like catering to whatever the instructor wants rather than a demonstration of what the student has learned. Does not feel sur does not surface joy in learning. Yeah, I like that a lot. 
Uh, so in our definitions, there were some examples um, that you all pulled out in terms of discussion board, but are there any other um, types of examples of traditional assignments? Worksheets, research essay, quizzes, uh, chapter questions. Melissa, I like your uh, option to Marie Kondo them, yes. Uh, reflections. Uh, some more votes for worksheets, research essays, and quiz. Uh, geometry proofs, reflection essay, online discussion boards. Sometimes it's hard to figure out the next one that came in. I think maybe just quiz or worksheet got bigger. A uh, research paper, practice questions, discussion posts, practice worksheets. Yeah, we're all we're all sort of circling the same um, same examples here of what a traditional assignment would be. Uh, so these are a couple of other assignments. I think you um, hit on most of them actually in your responses. Uh, but you know, again, discussion boards where students have to answer a question and they reply to X number of their peers. Uh, deliverables that just get thrown away after class. This could be printed posters or uh, somebody wrote you know five hundred word essay. Uh, reflections without connections to course materials or ones that lack transparency for why they matter. Uh, so that was in your some of your definitions around traditional assignments or why students aren't interested in traditional assignments. They don't see where those connections are being made. They don't know how to make those meaningful connections to the material or how that process creates knowledge transfer. Essays only the student and the instructor see, so that closed feedback loop. Uh, same with maybe creating media learning objects that, again, have that same closed feedback loop. It's so important for students to see each other's work and interact with each other and see each other as knowledge creators, too. And then just an overall feeling of busy work. And so let's shift our thinking now and uh, into renewable assignments. Uh, so moving from traditional to renewable, how would you define a renewable assignment? Engaging a class created textbook. Something that has value beyond a particular class. Things that students uh, are self motivated to do. An artifact that a student can use in future learning or career. Students five cohorts down get the benefit of learning from all five previous cohorts. Transparent and scaffolded shared with the world's knowledge commons, ongoing. Yeah, some more, some more patterns here. Assignments that have value for students, that they're motivated to do, a student-driven that goes beyond just this one classroom, those four walls or, I don't know, four sides of a computer screen, um, something that facilitates learning for people beyond the class roster and has value in the real world impacts the community beyond their class, something the instructor would never have thought to design because they are not in the student's shoes. Yeah, I, I love that uh, definition. That really gets at that sense of agency that students have and taking control over their learning experience and allowing students to have say in what they're working on. Engaging and content related where students see the connection to materials they are learning. Yeah, these are all uh, excellent definitions. Uh, and here are two uh, more official definitions for renewable assignments. Uh, I'm not going to um, read them all out, but I think what they both really hit on is how you can transform all of those examples of traditional assignments by providing outside value, engaging in assignments that feel meaningful to a student and could impact their community. These are assignments that we hope students will want to hang on to, or, or at least be able to transfer the skills to something else as they grow and move on to other courses uh, and their life. Um, and as we talked about in session one, where we define open pedagogy, these types of assignments uh, are possible because they engage in the 5R activities. 
So what are some examples of renewable assignments? I know um, in defining them, we also had some examples there. Uh, so if you would, wouldn't mind also putting them in, in this slide as well. Class created textbook, video, textbook chapters, websites, textbook edits, Wikipedia, podcasts. Uh, uh, community guide. Test banks. Uh, public reflection blogs, uh, class created syllabus, Wikipedia editing, students that draft a quiz. Uh, a letter to someone, student designed exhibit. Photos of concept example. Yeah, those are some really, uh, really great examples. I think I got them all. And so here are uh, some other examples. Uh, so maybe a social annotation of a reading, reading anthology excerpts, uh, contributing to an open textbook. So some of these are uh, examples that you shared as well, writing quiz questions, uh, creating tutorials for their fellow students or the public, uh, creating topic websites, editing Wikipedia, uh, or creating a list of maybe common problems or advice for writing after doing some peer review and uh, self-reflecting on their own. All of these assignments work towards giving students meaningful connections to their course materials with a choice in how they interact with them and the ability to share beyond that one single purpose. So some tips for getting started. Um, this was uh, also some of the solutions um, I think Anita mentioned was starting small um, when we talked about some barriers with open pedagogy. Um, moving from traditional to renewable assignments can have a huge impact on your pedagogical approach and design to a course. Uh, so it's really important to think about how you can get started with renewable assignments. And I think that the first thing is that is to remember that it is okay to start small. Just changing one assignment or even just one aspect of an assignment is a great way to get started. And you don't have to overhaul your entire course. Um, and these, uh, these types of assignments exist on a spectrum. So you might start small by just offering students the opportunity to maybe pick the format they submit the assignment in, uh, giving them a little bit of agency over their work. And as you get more comfortable with practicing open pedagogy, you sort of shift the needle further towards an all-encompassing renewable assignment. The main goal is to create active, authentic assignments assessments that provide students with a choice and the option to do something. Uh, some key pieces to keep in mind are how does this assignment meet your learning outcomes and objectives, uh, just like you would with any traditional assignment? What do you want your students to get out of this learning experience? And maybe whether there is a particular tool that would be useful for the assignment. Even when starting with just a single assignment, it's still super important to think about how you'll scaffold it. This it will likely be very new to your students. So you'll need, you'll need to consider how you'll build in the support structures that they might need uh, for any new tools or concepts that you'll be using. And your renewable assignment should bring to the center opportunities for knowledge transfer. Uh, so let's look at um, a couple of different ways that you can start small um, and sort of shift into these renewable assignments. Uh, so one small step would be to take a discussion board assignment and turn it into a social annotation assignment. Uh, typically, these assignments are pretty prescriptive. There's not a lot of real choice other than picking the two other students you're going to respond to. Um, and it usually feels like busy work. Uh, but moving to a social annotation assignment um, is one way you can go from traditional to renewable. Uh, social annotation can be done in a couple of different ways. You could use a, a specific tool like Hypothesis to have students annotate directly in their assigned reading. You could even use the discussion board uh, technology that's built into your LMS to do a social annotation and have students um, be familiar with the technology that they're using, but get to participate in a different way, maybe by doing something like a seek and share. Um, this is where students can find another piece of media, like an image or a video or a song uh, that relates to that passage. Uh, it's a really fun way for students to engage with 
uh, the material and share in a way that gives them some choice and agency and makes those more meaningful connections. Uh, and this was another example uh, that you all shared as well, um, is creating a question bank. Um, so in this particular example, students authored over a thousand questions, and which took the place of them actually having an exam. And a key part of this process was the way in which the quiz question writing was scaffolded. So students were both supported with the types of questions they were writing and consistently building on previous skills. So after defining renewable assignments, uh, looking at some examples and thinking about ways that we could start small, what do you think students would appreciate about renewable assignments? It's relevant. Uh, something to show grandma, they shape the approach, potentially fun. Uh, sharing is motivating, reusability, it's unique. Uh, it, there's personalization, there's sustainable value, choice, uh, reusability, interesting, saying, look what I made. Uh, did I get the home? Students more empowered, definitely engaging. It's different. I think I got them all. Um, choice. Yes, choice. I see choice becoming bigger. Um, so yes, that is uh, kind of the critical piece to, um, to doing open pedagogy. Uh, so at this stage in the learning circle, uh, we talk about the tool that we use for the week. Um, so each week we explore a different learning tool that can be used to create or supplement uh, renewable assignments or digital learning objects. Uh, so during the pre-work for the week, uh, participants get to play around with that tool. And then during the session, we ask some questions, um, you know, if they've used it previously, what was their experience like, and if they could maybe see themselves using it in the future. And then we always link to our uh, tool documentation so folks can explore more tools and look at more use cases. Um, you can see we have a difficulty level out of five computers. Uh, and so one out of five computers might be a difficulty level for a particular tool. All right, so we are at the end of our session for the week. Let's see how everyone is doing. And so this is where we get a little bit of assessment um, about each session and how folks are feeling at the end of a um, at the end of our learning circle sessions each week. Uh, so ready to go, excited. All right, lots of ready to goes and excited. We're kind of tied here. Maybe it was the maybe it was the GIF that was the separating uh, option here. What is one thing you're taking away from today's session? Hope. Traditional, not disposable. Considering how to create our version of a learning circle, starting small. Uh, the workshop itself is really short and something that I would be comfortable delivering. Helpful resources. Tools for engaging students in the classroom. Optimism. Presenting a new tool in each session using a flipped classroom model. And what excited you about the topics? Having resources available to adapt. Yes, everything again is uh, openly licensed. Uh, so you can use uh, everything that we've talked about today New way to look at teaching. Maybe a cat walked across the computer. Really creative assignment possibilities. Uh, positive impact. Oh, not a cat, Winnie. Positive impact for student learning and motivation. Winnie is a, Winnie is a dog. Scalability.
I think that it would open up a lot of conversations about options instructors have. All right, so our next steps for uh, week three are to do the pre-work. Our instructor folks will select their assignment that they're going to revise. Our instructor support participants will identify their audience for the learning object, and we will explore our tool, our next tool of the week. Um, we are running behind, Jamie, so I think we're going to skip this, and I okay. would recommend, unless you disagree, going to share some of the outputs, some of the what they've created, um, and then hopefully we'll get, you know, maybe five minutes for breaks, for, uh, not for a break, for questions, sorry. Sure. Okay, so these are our examples uh, from our actual cohort of uh, the learning circle. Um, so these are from various different cohorts. Uh, this first one is a uh, renewable, or sorry, a digital learning object that was created by Amanda Gray from KPU. And uh, so this uh, infographic captures a conversation and discussion we had um, about how renewable assignments exist on a spectrum, which is something that we've talked about. Um, it's a really wonderful resource that really gets to some of the nuances in renewable assignments and open pedagogy. Uh, this is a another digital learning object that is a um, a professional development workshop that Leanne Orasaki at Hawaii Community College created. So this is a really great presentation that she's been able to use uh, with her colleagues for talking about open pedagogy and renewable assignments. Uh, History of Science, this is a renewable assignment final project. History of Science was created by Dr. Lauren Woolsey professor at Grand Rapids Community College. I believe she is uh, here today. Um, her assignment gives students choice over their projects in both licensing and submission format, as well as topic. And it also makes a contribution to the broader work of astronomy and who is included in the canon of astronomers and ancient culture study. She drew on all of the learning circle sessions to center student agency, students as knowledge creators and student belonging. And our last example here is another renewable assignment. And this was created by Professor Julia Baumgart at Marion University. And her assignment gives students the opportunity to become knowledge co-creators. It gives them choice over what types of resources to create. And it allows for further iteration semester after semester uh, by future students. And these are all featured on the Open Pedagogy portal if you'd like to look at them a little bit more deeply. All right, so we have our curriculum and this is uh, what you get. We have, you have access to um, all of the curriculum. Again, it's completely openly licensed. There's the Canvas course, which is broken down into the seven session modules, as well as a module on how to use the curriculum and facilitator resources. The facilitator resources uh, include all of the slide decks, the participant handouts, instructions for the final projects, email templates, and pretty much everything you saw in the learning circle session we just did. That is in a, a Google folder. And then the tools documentation is also linked in the tools section of each module. Um, and just recently, I finished putting um, notes on all of the different slide decks for each session. Uh, so they, are, they now all have accompanying uh, presenter notes if you want to adapt any of those uh, slide decks for your own use. Okay, that was a lot. Uh, like Tanya said, we I think last time we had a lot of extra time. This time we must have added some extra some extra info and tips and tricks in here for you. Um, so how are you feeling after all of this today? Like an open pedagogy master, I like that. I learned a lot and I'm still learning. I also feel the same way. I think there, there's something new to learn about open pedagogy uh, every time I talk about it with, with someone else. But a couple of couple of masters. Um, I'm also kind of feeling I'm tired and I want to go home too. This was a lot of talking, uh, but I'm glad that everyone um, learned a lot and they're still interested in learning more. All right. And these are just uh, some of the resources that we've already talked about. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump to our question slide in case anybody has anything they'd like to share or any questions they'd like to ask. I'm just, uh, I don't have the chat up, so just give me a second to uh, pull the chat up. 
Cheryl's asking a good question about FERPA considerations. And does the, does the Open Ped stool, to, Student Toolkit deal with that a little bit, Jamie, if I'm, am I remembering correctly? Yes, the, the Student Toolkit does have some information for students about FERPA, obviously, for, as well as for instructors. We also have some resources on the portal that talk about release forms for students um, and how uh, they can protect their own identity. Um, and so there are definitely um, some implications and considerations around FERPA, um, but the, uh, as Amanda said, most folks or some folks have people sign a FERPA waiver. Um, there's a way to protect, um, you know, student identity. If a student wants to open their license something, but they don't want it associated with themselves, they can, um, you know, license it anonymously. Um, so there are certainly, certainly considerations, but I think, um, all are workable if a student is uh, willing and wants to participate in an open pedagogy. Yeah, and also thanks to Cheryl for reviewing the student toolkit as well. And uh, Amanda. Yeah, any other questions before we kind of head into the final slide? Open ped is big and squishy. Uh, and we've been delving into it, you know, for about two and a half years and have tried to make it less squishy, but the squishiness just keeps coming out. But I think it's exciting. There's so many opportunities for improved pedagogy. Uh, to move the portal from PubPub, oh, Jamie, that's a question I'll let you handle. Uh, yes, I was um, quite taken aback to receive the email last week that said they were moving to a paid model. Um, so we, I mentioned it to Tanya, but it was literally Friday last week and we've had engaged this week. So we have not, um, not really gone into the details of what we're going to do uh, yet. But yes, it is very disappointing. Um, I didn't expect it. I haven't really seen any conversation around this potential move uh, to a paid, a paid service, a paid hosting service. Um, so, yeah, and I know there are other folks in our community uh, that use PubPub, too. So, uh, yeah, if anybody has any thoughts on it, I'd be, I'd be happy to, to hear your own thoughts on that. I will say that they are so, it is still um, open source. You just would have to host it yourself if you want to do it. Librarians are fighting in the chat. LibGuide it. No, <laughs> don't. Anything but that. I love that. Okay, I'm going to head into the final slide. Um, Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, if today's session sparked ideas, questions, or thoughts, we encourage you to continue that conversation in the Google group or reach out to us. Um, also, we'll have a space for continued discussion on this topic later today at the Open Pedagogy Resources Overview, which is at 1245 Central. Finally, we want to, is that right, Barb? Now I'm questioning whether that time is right. Finally, we want to remind you that this session has been recorded and will be shared with you via email posted to the community hub. Also, you are welcome to join us at our Open Pedagogy Community of Practice meeting, which occurs the last Wednesday of every month, but we're going to have to switch it up because some people can't make that time. So we have to figure that out, but feel free to email me or Jamie if you'd like to be added to that group. Um, and finally, thanks again for all of you for joining us and engaging, and we hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone.